He uh, is uh, director of the uh, uh, what? Uh, computational philosophy laboratory. And I, in a way, might ask you more about that before and what you do, but um, that sounds uh, fascinating. He's, uh, of course, written a, a, a good deal on models, especially in relation to our cognitive uh, uh, functioning uh, and so forth. Um, and, what am I trying to think of here? Dynamical models of uh, uh, the phrase is uh, escaping me. Uh, Lorenzo also has a, uh, a a strong interest in applied philosophy, in practical matters of, of ethics and uh, that sort of thing. Um, and my impression is he's also valuable to our profession as a uh, fundraiser and, and uh, organizer. And he's been involved in many editorial and, and fundraising projects, not only of his own, but in, in helping out in the, uh, the uh, uh, philosophical culture. Of the so uh, without further ado, uh, his title today, Scientific Models are Distributed and Never Abstract. Quote the Raven, never more. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tom. And thanks uh, to all the people that are attending the conference. Thanks to Emiliano Poli, Emiliano Lacapo to be the direct coordinator of the funds that were already quoted by Thomas. Okay, so the title is a bit provocative because I say they are distributed, they are not abstract. Of course, do not misunderstand me. I do not really think that we cannot say that scientific models are, are not abstract. They are abstract. But if we adopt a more cognitive oriented approach and a kind of approach that is informed by a naturalized philosophy, I believe in the naturalization of philosophy, that is a philosophy that respects scientific results and science that respects philosophical results, if we have any. Okay. <laughs> uh, if we adopt this approach, of course, we are legitimate to say that scientific models are never abstract in another sense of the word. So, I already touched this problem that is also to summarize against the image of scientific models as fictions. And when the, the fictionalists say that scientific models are fiction, believe me, they are thinking that they are fictions exactly like Anna Karienina. Tolstoy was already quoted, so I don't think scientific models are like Anna Karienina. Anna Karienina is a good result. Also in knowledge, because Anna Karienina permits to us to know a lot of things about human beings. But this is the fictionalist way of building knowledge regarding human beings. It is not the scientific way. In science, we cannot say, in my opinion, that scientific models are fictions. I touched this problem already in Pavia, in, excuse me, in the previous model-based reasoning conference in 2011, and in China, in Guangzhou, in 2013. I published already a, a, an article with the title Scientific Model are not fictions. That is not, I didn't send it to a, a, a mainstream ger, international journal because I thought that it was not good to address this topic of the analytic philosophy. Because paradoxically, this esoteric concept of fiction belongs to the analytic philosophy tradition. Okay. And paradoxically too, I sent a paper on gossip to an analytic intellectual journal, by the way, Sutez, and it was accepted. So I was not inclined to send a, 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 a something about science, but uh, I was inclined to send something about gossip, morality, violence, and so on. Okay, so. Let's start. Scientific models are now not only considered as, of course, obvious as useful ways for <laughs> or discovering. I underline the word discovering 
because I am always stressing the dynamic aspect of science, new entity, laws and theories, but are also rubricated under various new levels, from the classical ones, abstract entities and idealizations, the previous presentation already dealt with this aspect, but not only, also the fictions and so on. So mine is a continuation of the previous presentation. To the non reset fictions, credible words, missing systems, surrogate models, make believe, parables, Nancy Carpenter, parables, like Jesus Christ, parables as functional as epistemic action. This is more originating from the cognitive science tradition, as revealing capacities, still hard to write, as mediator between theory and experiment, as pedagogical devices for testing hypotheses for explanatory functions. So this is not a, an exhaustive list, but anyway, it is a list that contemplates many ways of, mod of considering modern model in an epistemological tradition. I think that models, both in scientific reasoning and, and in human perception too. So this is a kind of uh, jump to another field of knowing the world. We know the world through perception with human beings, but also the animals, but we know the world also through science, are neither mere fictions, simple surrogates or make-believe, nor they are unproblematic idealizations. In particular, modern science, the Newton and Nagarastra, contrarily to the received view, the recent received view, because in reality the received view is of the tradition is the structural view about scientific models and scientific uh, reasoning, but we already we had have, we have already the previous presentation about this topic and also I have to say that also in Bristol that it is uh, they are uh, the colleague is questioning the structuralist view from many perspectives. Okay, models are always distributed material entities. This is the naturalized approach to philosophy. Either when we are dealing with concrete diagram or physical and computational models, they are concrete objects, they are physical objects. Or when we face human mental models. The so-called mental models at the end are indeed particular, are repeatable, so they are always changing the models. And ever changing configurations and transformation of neural networks and chemical distribution at the level of human brains. In this perspective, we can say that models are, are abstract only in a quickian sense. That is, as mental models shared to different extents by groups of scientists, depending on the type of research community at stake. But of course, imagine many scientists, even if there is, a, so to say, something in common, the models are different the mental reproductions. Moreover, they are also distributed in what I call external epistemic mediators. The models are not only in the brain as neural networks, but as everyone knows they are everywhere in a personal computer, in a blackboard, in another kind of a presentation, in a laboratory, through objects of various kinds, not necessarily only computational, and so on. Okay, anyway. I contend that the so-called abstract model can be better described in terms on what Nersessian and Chandra Sekhar call manifest model. What is a manifest model? Imagine always when I am uh, speaking about this subject, the unconsidered scientific uh, science as something flexible, so to say dynamic, living, a living, not a uh, cognitive object that is changing. 
when the scientific collective decides whether the model is, is worth pursuing and whether it would address the problems and concepts researchers are faced with, it is an internal model and it is manifest because it is shared and allows group members to perform manipulation and thus form common movement representations of the proposed concept. I am quoting from the session and standards. Also in Provis, the manifest model, model also in Provis group dynamics from a cognitive point of view because there is an exchange of opinions, ideas and so on. Of course, the internal representation presents slight differences in each individual brain, but this does not impede that the various specific representations are clearly thought to be abstract, insofar as they are at the same time conceived as referring to a unique model. But there is not this unique model, because in reality, there is a model, an external model, for instance, a diagram, and various representations in the brain. So these are many kinds of models, because models are distributed. You know that in cognitive science, there is a tradition that is called the tradition of distributed cognition. When they say, and I say, uh, uh, they see, and I see cognition, not only happening inside the brain, but also in the external world through the manipulation of human beings of the external world and the representations delegated to the external, to the external world, for instance, scientific models, but not only. Okay, this research illustrates two concrete external models as functional and behavioral approximations of neurons, one physical in vitro networks of cultural neurons, and the other consisting in a computational counterpart as recently built and applied in a neural engineering laboratory at Georgia Tech in Atlanta. So you see that we deal with the, with the model that is in the living scientific reserves, but there is the in vitro one, there is the computational one, and there are the mental ones that are always in an interplay with the model, with the external models, and with the manipulation of the external models that changes and produce possible results. We can use a word of the ecological psychology, new affordances. So I am afforded by a model because I manipulated the model and I am afforded by something new, for instance. This is extremely important in scientific tradition because science is always looking for something new, anomalies, curiosities maybe, that are able to stimulate changes in your images of, uh, of the models and of the world. Okay, epistemic, what is epistemic warfare? warfare? Be patient for a moment. In science, there is also what they call an epistemic warfare. Fictions or epistemic weapons. Okay. So, I will explain rapidly. I aim at substantiating my critique of fictionalism, if we use the term in the unequivocal sense established in narrative literary frameworks, because these people, many people that speak about uh, fictions, always make an analogy to the literary fictions. Outlining the first feature of my own approach to the role of scientific model, it's called not in terms of what I call it is the reward, which sees a scientific enterprise as a complicated struggle for rational knowledge. This is obvious. This is the reality. We do not have to speculate philosophically. philosophically. The uh, uh, tradition of science, from the Rivero at least, is a struggle for rational knowledge, in which it is crucial to distinguish epistemic, for instance, scientific models, 
from non-epistemic, for example, fictions, falsities, propaganda, weapons, that are completely present in the scientific tradition. Uh, I, cert I certainly consider scientific enterprise a complicated epistemic warfare, so that we could closely expect to find fictions in this strata for actual knowledge. But fictions are, in this case, real fiction, false things, uh, horrible things, but that work. Are not fiction typical of any struggle which characterizes the conflict of human coalitions of any kind? Of course, imagine the politicians. They always, always make fictions, also the mass media. They are false, no problems. The important is that they are convincing, for instance. They work, okay. Fair advent, to quote an authority, clearly stressed in, against Milton how, despite their eventual success, the scientists' claims are often far from being evenly proved and accompanied by propaganda and psychological tricks in addition to whatever intellectual reason he has to like in the case of Galileo Galilei. Because against people in this case is very clear. Galileo not only used scientific models that are not, not that are not fictions, not only he was the builder of the new scientific tradition. So his models were particularly part, important in the history of human knowledge but also used a lot of uh, false experiments, propaganda, tricks. Also, Galileo Galilei had a bad character. Uh, but uh, anyway, he was able to survive and to be the new tradition, <laughs> notwithstanding the bad character. OK. The fundamental role of models in science. I'm very really benign that models as idealization and abstraction are a pervasive and permanent feature of science. And you have seen, I hope, in which sense I consider uh, co uh, consistent this idea of the abstractness, uh, abstractness and ideality. Nor that models which are produced with the aim of finding the consequence of theories, for instance, that often are very smart and creative because you are looking for some consequences, so you can make testing, uh, confirmations, possible classifications, are very important. But I just stress that the fundamental role, in my opinion, played by models in science is the one we find in the core conceptual discovery processes. Discovery processes, discovery processes. And then these kinds of models cannot be indicated as fictional at all because they are constitutive of new scientific frameworks and new empirical domains. You will see that in this case, I am not only related to the tradition in artificial intelligence, uh, the computational uh, laboratory that is related to the problem of discovery, of experts, expert reasoning, but also the problem of abduction, that is one of my topics of research, that mm -hmm. is the making of new hypotheses, new hypotheses, not only to select a hypothesis that you already know, like in uh, medical diagnosis. But also, I am Italian, I was trained philosophically in Italy, also to the Kantian tradition, okay? The Kantian tradition, that the neo-Kantian tradition that was present in Italy, together with the idealistic tradition, because the the analytic Anglo-American tradition arrived to, it, arrived to Italy during the 50s. Uh, Ludovico Gemona, the first course in Italy uh, in philosophy of science, was in Pavia in uh, 1953. Ludovico Gemona taught history of philosophy in Pavia as a full professor and took the position, the temporary position of philosophy of science. So in the 50s, but there was the neo-Kantian tradition too. So when, when you are stressing the constitutive aspect of scientific models, and I will show to you a, a very classical example, 
even a bit trivial, but good, you are reflecting something tangible. You know, the, the fact that you are constituting, I am using in this moment Kantian words, you are constituting, you are building, constructing, constructing the possibility of the experience. So it is a bit of philosophical terminology, but it is, it is good. It is in this uh, uh, constitutive of new scientific frameworks and new empirical domains. It is in this perspective that I consider, from an epistemological point of view, ancillary, not, I, I, I consider the topic, of course, but not like the, the creative ones, uh, that is pragmatic, differential functions of knowledge. For example, for generating, generating quick and expedient inference. Uh, and the differences at the theoretical level. And from this level to the experimental one. So this is the fundamental role in, in my view. Modern, I'm so to say, just modern that idealize and or abstract. But these last two aspects have to be strictly criticized in the light of research epistemological content literature, a special <coughs> of epistemic action. Because if we see science from a dynamic point of view, we are always faced with actions, with the behaviors that are going to be areas, but they are, but that are also actions. Abstractness and ideality cannot be solely related to empirically in adequacy or to theoretical incoherence in a static view of the scientific enterprise. I will try to show what I am thinking in this case. Because if you have an idea of a static, established scientific theory, you can see that the models are approximations, with false assumptions, with respect, so to say, to the final assessment of the theory. But if, we, if you see the, the theory in, his, in its development, the situation is different. So, this, this comes back to the problem uh, introduced by Nessin Alsatian and the other author, that is the concept of trauma coding. This is a neurobiological neuro that is an example of what uh, I call manipulative attraction, or light manipulative attraction. So when you are building new hypothesis, not only thinking, like in the armchair, okay, exploiting only your neural networks, armchair uh, philosophy, armchair thinking, that I think it doesn't exist, but always in, in a distributed arena, okay, in a distributed situation, Common code justifies this aspect because this idea of common code hypothesizes that the execution, perception, and imagination of moments share a common representation, a common representation, coding in the brain. This coding leads to any, any one of these three, say perception of an external moment, automatically triggering the other two, imagination and execution of moments. Common code guarantees the integration between internal and external models. So there is this interplay. The external model perturbs the internal one. This is extremely important. This is why we can see from a neurobiological perspective, we can, it is trivial the idea of, of isomorphism of models. Because of uh, total isomorphism. Because uh, you cannot have a kind of isomorphism because there is a continuous interplay. You change your model in the brain or the model is changing externally. And so in this case, you change the model in the brain. Uh, you move the model thanks to a new idea in the brain and the model presents to, uh, to you something new that is perturbs the internal one in an unpredictable ways, providing a chance for change, often innovative, in the internal model. 
new brain areas can be activated, creating new connections, which in turn can motivate further manipulation and revision of the external model. You see that in this case, I am undebted to the tradition of distributed connections. So this continuous interplay between internal representation and external representation. In fact, it is particularly important in science. Because in science, it is always important to manipulate the world. Not only to get confirmation of falsification, but also to produce new ideas, to make experimentations, to produce new perspectives and new ideas. So this is a kind of classical idea that uh, fictions, um, that scientific models are not fictions. Even if Isaac Newton is speaking about hypotheses and not about models. But it is clear what is the target of uh, scientific uh, cognition. This is new. I have not as yet been able to discover the reason for these properties of gravity from phenomena. And I do not think hypothesis. So I do not use fiction. So even if you know that uh, Newton was uh, related to the tradition of alchemy. In reality, the notion of action at distance is a bit esoteric. <laughs> but anyway, the target, the pragmatic struggle against nature is not to feel hypothesis, is to find scientific truth. That are not the truths of Tolstoy in uh, uh, Anna Karlievina or of Dostoevsky in the Fratelli Karnazzi uh, uh, problems. For whatever is not deduced from the phenomenon must be called a hypothesis. And hypothesis, whether metaphysical or physical, or based on two qualities or mechanical, have no place in experimental philosophy. In this case, the word hypothesis is used in a negative terms, not in the, in the modern terms. Uh, Terms, uh, as an equivalent of something fictional, something stupid, something unimportant in science. In this philosophy, particular propositions are inferred, inferred from the phenomenon. And after work rendered zero by induction, you know that induction was the mainstream word to indicate uh, discovery processes, at least from Aristotle, even if. Carlo Cellucci, that is presently, recently demonstrated and showed also to the epistemological audience that Aristotle is, Aristotle is much more richer because there are aspects that refer to the analytic method, uh, to abduction, and other aspects. Okay, so this is just uh, Newton. Okay, to remember that uh, it is not so uh, polite about fictions in, in the tradition of science. Because you, go, you immediately contrast with the tradition, for instance, of Isaac Newton. Okay. <coughs> in science models are not used and intended as fiction. In science models are not used and intended as fiction. Imagine a scientist, so he says, okay, I am building a fiction. No, this is not immediately the psychological attitude of the scientist. The scientist is imagining to make a new model that is looking for something positive, for something true. Fictionalism tends to obfuscate the distinction between different areas of human cognition, such as science, religion, arts, and theology. In the end, epistemic fictionalism tends to enforce, in my opinion, a kind of epistemic concealment which can obliterate the actual gnoseological finalities of science, shading in a kind of debate about tests and their classification that will remind of medieval scholasticism. That is, you know, many, many individuals, many things, many concepts, something baroque, something uh, complicated. And you cannot see differences at a certain point. Because, okay, in science there is always confirmation and theater confirmation, at least in natural science, and uh, uh, or empirical falsification. But what about psychology? What about uh, 
uh, economics, so what about human sciences, uh, uh, and so what are the differences between arts, religion, and philosophy, and so on. So in this case, the, the, the word fiction is uh, uh, dangerous, I think. Let's, let me make an example. I contend that at least in a discovery cognitive process, so in a discovery cognitive process, the missing system that was introduced by Thomson Jones is now paradoxically the one represented by the model, but is still the target system itself. Because he said, in a static view of science, he said the model in reality is the missing system. But the problem is that if you have only the model, you do not have the target system at that stage. So you cannot speak about the missing system of what? Because you do not have the target model. It's not paradoxically the one represented by the model, but it's still the target system itself, still more or less largely unknown and unschematized, which will still appear as known in a new way only after the acceptation of the research process results, thus uh, uh, admitted into the theory T and considered worth to stay in T thereafter. The same can be said, can be said of models and configuration. This was introduced, introduced by the biologist Prof. Smith, which certainly are conditional, but at the same time not known not to exist in Godfrey Smith's sense. Because simply, in the moment in which a scientific model is introduced in the discovery process, it is instead exactly the only object we plausibly know to exist. In this case, it is the only thing that you have the model when you are looking for something new. So it is difficult uh, if you adopt a static idea of science, uh, it is uh, not correct uh, to say something negative about models uh, that possibly can lead to new important discoveries. Only, for example, a diagram in a blackboard or an in vitro artifact or a mental imagery. Okay. It's not a miss, something missing, because you do not have the target system. So you cannot say, okay, I have the target system, this model was just an approximation, there is something missing with respect to the target system. You do not have the target system, and so you cannot imagine that. You cannot say uh, anything uh, interesting about the model. The model can be unsuccessful. You have to change it, because it is not for yet. Productive. This is system and the uh, Only the of, of the strong metaphysical realism, we can state that once a final scientific result has been achieved, together with the description of the relative experimental side, everything that does not fit that final structure is a fiction. And so, only <coughs> that help reach the resultive side. I contend that in the case of scientific models, resemblance is constitutively partial. Also, because it is basically impossible to appropriately resemble things that are not yet known. It is not always acknowledged in the current literature that isomorphism, homomorphism, and similarity with the target system are not necessarily established so to say, a priori, because the target system has still to be built. <coughs> Imagine, for instance, I will call the important model, I will call later on, at the end of this speech, at the end of my presentation, the famous thought experiment of Galileo about the folding bodies. This is extremely important, <laughs> because it is a, con I am still using Kantian words, a condition of possibility of the building of the new physics. But you, when you have the, when Galileo built the thought experiment, the new physics was not yet ready, so to say, with the experimental level and so on. So it was completely constituted from this point of view. Uh, actually, this is an important point. It is just the work of models that of creating in a poetic way the resemblance to the target system. 
Some discovery features of the target system resemble the model, not because the model resembles them a priori, but only post hoc. Once discovered, thanks to the modeling activity itself. In so far as resemblance has been instituted by the model. The new features appear well defined only in the static analysis of the final developed theory. It is at this stage that the resemblance acquires the actual status of resemblance in the standard sense of the word civil similarity of two given entity structure. But I was looking for the support of Margaret Morrison, and there is. Margaret Morrison says, to say that fictional models are important sources of knowledge in virtue of a particular kind of similarity that they get to create cases of the system, is to say virtually nothing is not me, this Margaret Morrison, in United Kingdom, or maybe in Canada, I'm not sure. No, Mary Morgan is she is in Canada, uh, Margaret Morrison in United Kingdom. It is to say virtually nothing about how they do, do that. Instead, what is required is a careful analysis of the model itself to uncover the kind of information it yields and the ways in which that information can be used to create, this is the sense of creating, develop physical hypothesis. I still have five minutes. Yeah. Okay. And then, yeah. then we still have to yeah. 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 So five minutes to finish. Adopting cut right rigid demarcation criteria clearly and recently restarted if if not capacity, then not credible words. It would seem that no more citizenship is allowed to some postmodern exag exaggeration attributed and unexpected mm -hmm. values proliferating areas of academic production of knowledge. From parts of psychology, parts of economic, and so on, areas we do not, or scarcely, accomplish the most common received epistemological standard. For example, the predictivity of the phenomena that pertain to experience systems. Okay, we say, these are sciences, okay, they are just models. A, a kind of uh, encyclopedia of models. Also, in some cases, that you cannot compare each other. You know, that in the, in the, in the epistemological tradition, it is important to compare uh, scientific theories, uh, okay, facing with uh, experimental uh, uh, situations. So, for instance, there is not a predictive of phenomena that pertains to the space system. Are we sure that this demarcation is too rigid, or it is time to criticize some excessive proliferation of models so close to be scientific? It is in this perspective that the epistemological use of the so called credible words appears theoretically suspect, but ideologically clear. If seen in the military, I call military, it is a word of René Tom, the one of the catastrophe that has this view uh, of the struggle of uh, in cognition in the military framework of the academic struggle between disciplines dominated by a pattern proliferation of scientific activities that just produce their credible surrogate models looking aggressively for certificity because you know certificity certificity pays for instance to get funds when they actually are the best fragments of <coughs> sorry, bad philosophy, <laughs> credible and surrogate models. Okay, the last uh, slide. Okay. Il saggiatore del serio Galileo Galileo. I quoted Newton and now I quote Galileo. I seem to deserve the firm belief that in natural philosophizing there is new science, physics, the new physics, the born of the birth of it, one must support oneself upon the opinion of some celebrated author, as if our minds ought to remain completely sterile and barren unless wedded to the reasoning of some other person. You know this 
uh, often there is also the uh, contrast with the Aristotelians. But in this case, there is the contrast, the contrast with uh, Orlando Furioso, the Iliad, <laughs> so the literary fiction. Possibly he, Lotario Sarsi, a person of that time, not important like any other, he, is known through the day, through this quotation of the day, can do for him. Thinks that natural philosophy is a book of fiction by some writer, like the Iliad or Orlando Furioso, productions in which the least important things, in whether what is written, there is truth. This is the idea, the new truth, the new idea of truth, of the apocalypse of modern science. And then there is the famous potential. <laughs> Okay, okay, I will read it in honor of Galileo Galilei. Uh, philosophy written in this grand book, the universe, which stands continually open to our guests. It is written in the language of mathematics, and its characters are triangles, circles, and other geometric figures, without which it is humanly impossible to understand the single world of it. Without this, one wanders about in a dark labyrinth. The dark labyrinth of uh, be, uh, of lacking scientific truth, of course. If you are writing the Romans like Anna Karenina, it is not that you are not finding something interesting also from the point of view, but it is not science. Okay. So uh, that is the thought experiment of falling bodies, constitutive, Kantian, so not a fiction, and uh, I remember that the next year there will be the seventh conference, Modern Based Reason in Science and Technology, June 2015, Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Lorenzo. Uh, I, as you know, appreciate very much your focus on the, what used to be called the context of discovery. Uh, <laughs> and of course, I was trying to think of, of course, before was model based reasoning, uh, which uh, you were well, well, the conference. Well, 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 <laughs> orthodox, <laughs> many better is a good. Anyhow, open for questions. Uh, uh, yeah, thanks very much. Uh, which talk, I very clearly see the, the deep dislike that you have in this analogy between, the alleged analogy between models and fictions. Um, I, I want to probe how, how deep that dislike is by asking the following. So there's this uh, broader notion of, of pretense or uh, the age of make belief that people talk about in connection with fixtures. So the idea um, from these authors like Roman Frigg and Adam Turing who advocate this fictionalist idea of models is that this philosophical account of make belief, which are broader than fiction, um, can be applied to scientific models. So do you also I think so. Like that? The important is to separate them from the idea of fictions. Because if you adopt, in this case, a cognitive attitude about the reading of beliefs, you can say that the model is a dream of believing in something. For instance, imagine that I am, uh, but the problem is, there is still the problem, it is correct, in my opinion, but there is still, still the problem that uh, Thanks to obliterate differences, because it was also talks to me. Said, okay, I believe in, in uh, uh, another person, Anna uh, uh, Kawilova. <laughs> uh, I have this model, model of the character of my next uh, romance. It is a good, I believe, and it is the same cognitive process, the same uh, like in science. The problem is that you are, in the, in, in the case of Tolstoy, you are looking for a fiction. That has to be a good fiction, of course. Uh, in, indeed, Anna Karimina was a good fiction. In the other case, you are not looking for a fiction, but for something that is looking for a specific kind of belief that has to be the belief that is able to be the new perspective, to be the new perspective in science. I, I arrange your question in this way. Yeah, so I can see that there's potential for underlying. Credible, but the problem is that sometimes these people, they always speak about credible, credible models, uh, uh, make believe, uh, pretensions, uh, also linking them to the problem of fiction. Mm -hmm. In this case, I, I think that the word fiction is dangerous. 
not only from the epistemological view, also from the ideological point of view. Because I show, I try to show to you in two slides that there is also an ideological problem. So we cannot make confusions. There are already so many confusions in our world. We do not have to make confusion also at the epistemological level and to confuse models in religion, in science, in uh, literary works, uh, and so on. So there are different ways of building models, even if there are always are, uh, for instance, way of uh, believing something, way of uh, uh, pretending something, that's all. Oh, okay, yeah, uh, just a, a, a quick clarification for your question. Um, you mentioned in one of the slides the uh, difference between internal models and external yeah. models. Uh, I was wondering if you can go over the difference again and how they relate to each other. It's, it's interesting. So. so I will not use the lexicon of uh, distributed cognitive uh, tradition. But you know, it is also called uh, uh, it, it is also called embodied distribute, uh, distribute information that is embodied but also distributed. It is also called the, the theory of the extended mind, that is the mind that is okay. I will use Immanuel Kant in the critique of pure reason, in the methodology at the end of the critique. Kant says, give to a philosopher a triangle, the concept of a triangle and ask the philosopher to find what is the sum of the internal angles of the triangle. Kant says, the philosopher will think, will think, will think, will think, and we, he will not able to find <laughs> the, something new about the sum of the uh, uh, internal angles of the triangle. Then Kant says, Give the concept of a triangle, imagine to be in ancient Greek, in the ancient Greek, before Euclid, we do not yet know what are, what is the sum of the internal angles of a triangle. Give the triangle to a geometrician. The geometrician immediately will build, Kantian word, a construction. What is a construction? A representation in the external world of the triangle. Then he will manipulate the external figure, that is a model, and using the parallel postulate, immediately he will discover, he will discover what is the internal sum of the triangle. And indeed, the ancient geometry, the ancient geometry, despite Hilbertian image of geometry, was built mainly thank to this interplay between internal representation and external representation that is diagrams. In this case also the analytic synthetic idea of problem solving that I quoted earlier, quoted both Carlo Giannucci, it is extremely important because it is totally related to geometry. So in this case we can also uh, say something terrible for philosophers, that philosophy is uh, undebted to geometry, to the answer of geometry. Uh, so, the, the same in the case of in vitro and uh, computational models. You are manipulating the in vitro model, then you build the, the computational model of it. You get some, something, uh, some information from the in vitro model, some other information from the uh, uh, computational model, you compare the two models, to see, you see the mental models uh, of the colleagues, you ask the colleagues what do you think of these uh, aspects, you think by yourself in your brain your mental model, and then you will uh, change, for instance, the models, this is the, the idea of the interplay between internal and internal representation, extremely active in natural science, but not only in natural science, because imagine, imagine Imre Lakatos, confutation, what is the title of the book? Uh, demonstration and confutation. This is the, the real presentation of the fact that also the mathematicians always build proofs 
sketches uh, and uh, a kind of manipulation, an external manipulation of their ideas. Sergio, yeah. yes. So, uh, I can't agree with your point of view, nonetheless, I wish you to know your opinion about uh, the following fact. Uh, I mean, the history of science is full of examples where the scientists used fictions with these I new models that were never meant to represent physical reality, but that were extension of models beyond the reach of physical reality. And in many cases, those fictitious models helped us understanding physical reality, increased our knowledge of physical reality, and were undoubtedly uh, progresses in, in science nonetheless. So I wanted, uh, so okay. it seems that science is too take advantage of fiction sometimes. Can you do this again? You must have it Yeah, so, uh, so um, um, you may, for instance, ask what would gravity look in a five-dimensional world? And this may be answered by taking uh, uh, the theory of gravity and applying it to, to a five-dimensional and unexisting, so far, an existing world. And then look at the consequences. So what would gravity look in a five-dimensional or uh, 10 dimensional world, and you may answer that question even if that doesn't apply to the real world. And you can claim that it gave you a deeper understanding of gravity in the real world. Okay. Something it is very simple to answer, at least in yes. my opinion. <laughs> at least in my opinion. Okay, so one count is the use of the word fiction or fictitious in the everyday common interplay of words and so on because you can use I have it. it is a kind of synonym to use a better word a less compromised word of imagination okay imagination is more uh, sophisticated than. so this is one counting is to use this word another count is to be a philosopher, so the uh, a person that incarnates the tradition of the philosopher. And to use the word fiction, equating it uh, to the literary fictions, and to write papers in mainstream academic journals, you have to adopt different responsibilities, okay? Different epistemological, cognitive, and uh, pedagogical also responsibilities. So in this case, you okay, you are, are using what you say, okay, I'm, I am imagining some this, this strange object. But this is just science. It is not fictitious. It, it is the creativity of less, uh, So Feyer Abend spoke about, he didn't know the word abduction because it was not used and recovered uh, in epistemology only later on. Also thanks uh, to my work but it is difficult because induction is still uh, uh, dominating like uh, the Aristotelian here. He used the word counter-induction. He said, but the problem is to build ideas that are completely inconsistent, unplausible. So in this talk, uh, uh, despite the fact that science is looking for plausibility of things, because you know truth is never reached. So also Carlo says this, tomorrow we will speak also about Carlo, that there are many of these things. Uh, despite the fact that we are looking for plausibility in science, but we are looking for, for often unplausibility, consistency in scientific creativity. Because you want to build a perspective that is completely new, that is unrelevant also with respect to what you already know, but that maybe will, uh, will constitute something new. From this point of view, the last 30 years of scientific, uh, uh, of the scientific worldwide enterprise are not particularly good. I attend, it is not my opinion, it is a bit my opinion, but I attended a conference in Kiel, in Germany, that was, the title was The End of Science or Beyond, provocative, of course, and there was, uh, there were statistical data and so on, that uh, science is uh, mainly normal science, to use a Kuhnian metaphor. 
in the last three decades. There are no new uh, perspectives, revolutions, uh, new law. Uh, uh, despite the fact that, for instance, when you see the big science, the quantity of facts from the 70s to today increased a, a lot. Yeah. You, you mean physics? In physics, ah, yes, exactly. in, in general. In general. So, uh, a, 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 a huge quantity of normal science, less quantity of revolutionary perspective. Oh, okay, do not misunderstand me. I don't, I, I'm not think, I'm not saying that normal science is uh, rubbish. Normal science is extremely important. You can improve, for instance, the therapy of cancer through normal science in a very huge way, but from the epistemological view, uh, point of view, you can also, you, you, you can also observe a kind of lack of revolutionary I used to see them in uh, 27. For a moment, follow up on Sergio's arm, which I find quite attractive. Um, so let me just ask, uh, in regard to the fiction's question, what, what is the role of truth that you see in, in, in this? And that it would seem that uh, with your own emphasis on uh, the process of getting to uh, better models, better accounts in the first place, the target is not available antecedently. Uh, and so, uh, uh, using the, the terminology of affordances that you uh, brought in from, uh, from Gibson and Norman and so forth, uh, you could say uh, the truth is uh, not affordable to us. It's not uh, available to us in the way that fertility is. Uh, uh, so where does truth come in? Well, somebody might say, uh, uh, well, see, I, I'm wondering if you, uh, you exaggerate uh, the danger of using fictions uh, when you, uh, you say it could lead us into uh, superstitious uh, medieval uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, pitfalls, uh, uh, political uh, you know, uh, propaganda, and that sort of thing. Uh, because, uh, well, somebody could say, ah, well, with the foreign, uh, with um, uh, uh, models, we can at least test them and find out when they're, uh, when they're empirically mistaken. But, uh, you know, most models are known to be that way from the get-go, number one. Uh, so you can't bring in truth uh, in any final or definitive way right there. I would say it's a matter of heuristic uh, fertility, and that, that often trumps truth. Uh, and so as long as you uh, use fictions in a way that's fertile, which seems to jive, uh, seem to resonate with some other things you said, that would be okay. Is that, uh, so anyway, I guess the pressure is then, where does truth come in exactly, and why are fictions uh, totally limitable? I can, I can relate the answer again to the answer that I had the physician, the physicist, not the physicist, the physicist. <laughs> that, okay, one can't is to use the word fictions in the everyday, in a laboratory setting, in everyday uh, speaking, uh, so another can't in epistemology. I, uh, I, true. A fiction, what these people, the fictionalists call fiction in science, it is not, it is, a, it, it is a particular kind of fiction. It is not a fiction because it, it is a model that is able to lead to scientific truth. What is the scientific truth? It is the typical truth that it is, that is the one that happens in science. There is a truth that is revisable, withdrawable, that has to face the experimental testing, and so on. So one kind, one kind is a model that use, is used in science, that you cannot call it fiction, like a literary fiction. Another kind is a model that is used in other aspects of human cognition, uh, because in the other aspects, human cognition, you are not looking for scientific truth. Okay. For instance, imagine a model in religion, the model of the, the Trinity. It's not a scientific truth, but it is an important model, because it is an important model that builds the ontology and uh, some of the aspects of the Christian theological tradition. And in that case, you can say it is a kind of religious fiction. But after the birth of natural science or physics, 
we need to distinguish, this is my ideological warning, we need to distinguish between things that are used in one way and in another way. So in this case, the, the connection to truth is the connection to the kind of truth that is built by the tradition of the scientific tradition. Revisable, for instance. The truth is not really revisable. You see, it is a, a truth, it is a model, but it is not withdrawable. Because it is a dogma. For instance, in science, we cannot establish uh, uh, models that are dogmas. Because they are always withdrawable. We uh, need to take our lunch break uh, yeah. almost immediately, okay. but if there's one last quick question, I, I would Another consider it. No hang with They are all for hang with Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you also to James. The two of them, I think, have got